Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I, I personally got interested in this field back over 20 years ago. I was a journalist uh, working in, based in Bangkok, Thailand, covering environmental issues for a local newspaper and television network. And it was a very polluted, cha chaotic, hectic environment. And uh, this was more or less what it looked like on some days there. And this may be familiar to you if you've been in, in, in mega cities around the world. Many cities in China, for instance, suffer from air pollution. And I was always, you know, I don't think curious is the right word. I was always dying to know, so to speak, what, what the heck I was breathing in. And it was quite frustrating because the government was not giving us any data on this. And, uh, and fast forward now to um, uh, the 21st century, and now we can more or less, uh, with a, it's become easier and cheaper than ever to find out for ourselves what it is we're breathing, what's in our environment, and to monitor uh, the, the world around us. And this is a, a, screen, a screenshot from uh, data compiled around the Beijing Olympics back in 2008 when the AP sent, uh, secretly sent in an air monitor and had its reporters collecting data and reporting on air quality during the Olympics. There's a lot of data you can collect these days um, with a little bit of technical help on all kinds of environmental issues. This is a project called Mapping the Mangroves that monitors these uh, very important coastal ecosystems and, and their status around the world. Uh, this is a scene from a, a neat story called Cicada Tracker that was put out by WNYC in New York, which is kind of a pioneer in using sensors. They handed out or they, they gave out um, sensors to monitor soil moisture and temperature now soil temperature I believe to track when the cicadas from brood 2 were emerging you remember last year that was a big story so this is a neat little story that let uh, WNYC's audience participate in following an emerging issue um, there's a lot you can do with for instance with remote sensing with infrared sensing uh, in this case there's a application to follow a flood flooding in Jakarta, in and around Jakarta. You can also use infrared um, to monitor vegetation and vegetative health and keep track of forest cover around the world. That's being done too. And it's not just the environment that you can monitor, of course. There are many uses for sensors. Uh, it's being used to keep track of where gunshots are going off and, and to monitor for cr crime statistics. Um, drone journalism, is, it's probably the most sexy issue related to sensors. Um, it's also in the U.S. it's quite difficult to carry out drone journalism because the FAA has essentially banned the use of drones for commercial purposes, at least for the time being, as they figure out regulations. But this is certainly a, a widely covered topic and we can expect to see a lot more in this field. Uh, this is a neat device that can actually it, it actually contains an electrocardiogram, so you put it on your head, and you can monitor people's attention spans. Right? Think about that. And that's something I'd really like to use for my students, especially when I'm lecturing, <laughs> keep track of how well they're paying, or maybe my kids. Um, and uh, there, I, there's one other application that I thought I'd mention. We might have someone in the audience named Topher White, um, who is uh, repurposing old Android phones to serve as noise monitors which are placed in the Indonesian rainforest to track for illegal logging through the use of chainsaws. So there's all kinds of interesting and innovative ways that sensors are being used to uh, monitor the environment, and we'd like to explore um, how journalists can do that. And so what is the Earth Journalism Network? What, are, wh why, what is our interest? Um, we are a project of Internews. We're a media development organization. We support the local press, okay? We're not a news agency ourselves. We support other news agencies around the world. And the Earth Journalism Network is a project within Internews that supports the improving the quantity and quality of environmental coverage. Um, we're, this is now our 10th year in operation, so we're very proud to be celebrating our 10th anniversary. We're now pretty much a global network. We have over 4,500 journalists registered on our website from over 120 countries at this point. And over the last decade, we've trained well over 3,000 journalists. And those journalists have produced 
over 4,500 stories just during our activities. Of course, they go back to their media houses and they produce a lot more. And they work on all different topics, for everything from climate change to environmental health, biodiversity, oceans, forests, fisheries. Um, our main activities, uh, education is certainly our bread and butter. We've done a lot of training. Um, but we also, um, so, well, education, and, and that is what actually brought me here to UC Berkeley. So we have a joint project now with the Graduate School of Journalism where we, every year we have a class called Earth Journalism and we teach a dozen students who we also send overseas on reporting trips so they can report firsthand, do original reporting on international environmental issues. It's a great opportunity for them and, and we believe it's, it's really crucial to the future of our, of our environment that we have good journalists being trained to cover these issues. Um, you can see here some of the projects we're doing, so not just here at Berkeley, but for instance in Southeast Asia, um, in Indonesia, in uh, China, we're working on ocean and fisheries issues, so we often match re uh, regional regions with uh, topical issues like oceans or climate or, or environmental health. Another topic, what we call network journalism, is um, supporting professional associations of environmental journalists locally. So um, I know working as a, as a journalist, one of the most useful things is to be a member of a professional association. They, you have, they get a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and you have more strength in numbers. You have a much better chance of getting information from hard to get sources if you can work together. So we've worked with a whole bunch of, of organizations. You can see some of them represented here, um, some of which we've actually helped to set up, others which have been, been going on for quite a while um, to help build their capacity. And here in the audience, uh, we have actually rep many representatives of these organizations who are in town this week for a conference. And I hope you can join us for the reception afterwards. You'll have a chance to meet with them personally. Uh, our third topic is what we call geojournalism, and this is combining traditional journalism with uh, data, with data journalism on, based on interactive maps. Uh, th and this is a, a, a really neat new way to present news. We've launched these geojournalism platforms in the Amazon region through a project called Info Amazonia. Here in the U.S., we have a, a platform called Climate Commons. And in Indonesia, we recently launched a platform called Equatorial. Here you can see an example of what I'm talking about very briefly. We have layers of data um, on a map. And on top of that, we have geotagged stories. So if you want to explore further, um, you can click on a story and go to original site and, and see what's being written or, or shown or produced. Um, and the neat thing here is that the data helps provide evidence to support the stories, and the stories provide narrative context for the data. So we think this is a, a, a way in the future to really combine different ways of providing information. Here's an example of our Indonesian project. You can see we've got, we've mapped not just forest cover, but also in this case we've mapped ocean traffic, marine traffic, to see what's, what's going on around the archipelago. Here in the U.S. we can map climate data to see what temperature anomalies are being felt, what precipitation anomalies, what extreme events like wildfires and wind events, extreme wind events. And that brings us back to sensors. Why are we experimenting with sensors? Well, um, where we work in many countries in the developing world, it's hard to get this data. Okay, Here in the U.S., actually, we're being flooded with data, and it's a matter of trying to find the time and expertise to mine it all and come out with good stories. But in many countries, that data is not available, especially when it comes to environment and health and other crucial and sensitive issues. So we need to work with journalists to get them out and about and collecting data for themselves. And that's what we're, we're, we've set about doing. That's part of the reason for this conference here this week. And with our big network, we think that uh, among the network, there are lots, there's lots of potential to, for journalists to work with scientists, with technicians, to go out and collect credible verifiable data that they can then report on. And then the idea is to perhaps map it, as we showed you with, through those geojournalism platforms. Um, we can make a lot of this rather technical, confusing data into clear, visualized reports that 
the public can easily understand. Um, so what are we working on now? Well, we decided to work with technologists to build a couple of cheap, easy-to-use sensors. One of them will measure air pollution, specifically particulate matter. And you'll be hearing from Matt Schroyer later this afternoon, who's building a, uh, a, a device called Dustuino, which uh, the journalists will be uh, taking out and, and using to collect their own data in their homes or uh, in their home cities on air pollution, especially, uh, specifically particulate matter, which is one of the most dangerous forms of pollution. The other uh, pollutant we're going to be exploring is actually something may, you may not think a lot about, but noise pollution is a real problem uh, for public health. If you've ever lived in a noisy environment or tried to sleep when there's a lot of noise going on, you know it seriously affects your health. And it is a major problem, even though it does not get reported on widely. So we've again worked with a couple of partners to build a noise monitor that, again, the journalists can take around and used to detect what noise is being mo uh, emitted where and, and hopefully to report on these issues. Um, we'll be working with journalists from a wide variety of countries and again, you'll have a chance to meet with many of them this afternoon, so I hope you stick around for that. Um, and we believe this is really just the start of this whole, perhaps a whole trend of, of sensor journalism, which we think can help democratize the whole process of data gathering, help decentralize it, make sure, allow a lot more people, allow citizen scientists to go out and collect data. And, and we understand that there also, this comes with concerns, including a lot of privacy concerns. And we're, I'm sure we'll be talking about that today as well. But we think there's opportunity here to improve public knowledge. And so that's why we're involved.